All right, y'all. Welcome back to another podcast. I had no idea. Um, I'm excited. Today, this morning, I am with someone who I just met probably, what, 10 minutes ago? Yeah. <laughs> um, she is someone who got referred by my friend Chris Sims, who was actually the last person on the podcast. Um, and today, really, we're just going to be talking about, um, we're going to be getting to know each other. Um, there's a lot of things that I think we can relate in. Um, again, we really don't know each other. So I wanted to just be, I wanted to be very natural and I wanted to kind of capture just us having our first few conversations. So if you would like to introduce yourself. Yeah. So my name is Haley Berger. Um, yes. I'm a grad student at KU, dual grad student actually. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm 23 and I'm not from here. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Let's, let's first dive into that. You know, what, um, where were you, let's say, where were you born and how did you get to Kansas out of all places? Sure. Yeah. So I was born in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, my birthday is in 2001, just to like put mm -hmm. it on the timeline. And for the first 10 years of my life, I went back and forth between Bangkok and Honolulu. Oh, wow. Uh, just because of where the families were. My mm -hmm. mom is Thai and my dad grew up in Hawaii and my dad did car sales. So um, that's what kind of took us back to the island mm -hmm. um, during that time. And, um, yeah, I mean, life was different. I, my first language was Thai yeah. for the first 10 years of my life. It's the only thing I knew. Mm. And then, uh, due to a little bit of a civil war, I would say, or between governments, um, that went to the streets in, in Thailand, I came to the States. I moved to Florida, which is where my mom's side of the family lives, where her parents live. And, um, took one suitcase, me, my mom, and my brothers, and we thought it would be a short little vacation. Mm. It was right around my birthday, I remember, nine days before my birthday, I was wow. crushed. I was crushed. Wow. And um, we ended up never going back. Mm. We had no clue when my dad was gonna be able to come to the States and see us. Um, when he did show up, I mean, I was shocked. Like, I, I expected years and years and years for it to take for him to, to come home. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so then spent seven years uh, starting over, essentially, um, my dad clawed his way back up in the car industry. Um, the reputation you have in Thailand doesn't necessarily transfer mm. back to the States. So um, he went from essentially running dealerships or having his name on them to being in the service department, starting mm. from, from square zero, or, mm -hmm. you know, square one. And um, I did the rest of elementary school, middle school, and the beginning of high school. So you're starting to get into your formative years of like, who am I? Mm -hmm. Where do I fit in? Mm -hmm. I was a band kid. I played volleyball. I did. I did everything. Like really, my parents made sure to to put me in everything so that I couldn't get to later in life and just like have no clue what I was doing. Just they wanted me to have a little bit of everything. Right. And um, then they surprised us and they said that we were moving to the the middle of the U.S. to Kansas mm -hmm. to Wichita and I put up a fight. Mm -hmm. I did not want to go. I had a mm -hmm. high school boyfriend at the time who I was really interested in. You know seeing out the relationship with and mm -hmm. i don't know i had no clue what to expect i thought everyone drove tractors to school i thought it was just like <laughs> farmland i thought there was no civilization i mean i was just so uncultured and ended up being one of the best moves of my life actually wow. like people ask me what my favorite place that i've lived in is and um florida taught me a lot about how to be like a human being and a right from wrong mm -hmm. but kansas i mean i i feel like i i grew up here um and I became who I am now here. Mm. And so I finished up my junior and senior year of high school down in Wichita. And I was able to do a joint program uh, at the high school to get my associate's degree. So I actually walked with my associate's degree. Whoa. Before. Yeah. And then two days later, I walked to stage for my high school degree. Whoa. Yeah. And so you. So I have like this. This is like side story. I have mm -hmm. like this issue because a lot of people like who have grown up in the same home their entire life, mm -hmm. they have their friends that they went to like all all their schools with. Yeah. And then you get to college and you see a lot of the same people and you just like you grow up with these people yeah. and you come home and you still see these people. Yeah. And I don't have a sense of belonging okay. because I don't have like that that group of friends I can call home mm. or that place that's like, Oh, I grew up here mm -hmm. or that bar. That's like, we all went here on Thursdays type okay. of thing. Wow. Um, yeah. Side story. But uh, yeah, then my, uh, my parents ended up moving to Ohio to the Cleveland area um, the same summer I graduated high school. And I thought that I would stay in state with them and um, mm. 
uh, unfortunately not. So they have been there for five years. Uh, I consider that home as well. I love the Cleveland area. Would I ever live there? No, mm. <laughs> but I do love it. And um, yeah, I still got two more years here okay. before I can uh, graduate and get all those extra letters after my name. Yeah. Wow. So what what are you going to school for right now? Yeah, so I'm a dual grad student. I'm working on my doctorate of pharmacy and my master's in business. Wow. That wasn't the original plan. I okay. say that and it's like, oh, wow, all these yeah. like letters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's not how it started. Okay. Um, it was originally just the PharmD. I wanted to be a pharmacist. I've been chasing the pharmacist idea since I was like in the sixth grade. One mm -hmm. of my dad's sisters is just my biggest mentor. Mm -hmm. And she's really held my hand through where I am now in my academics. And then, so pharmacy school, let me rewind, is a two, four program. So you do two years of undergrad, you work on prereqs. Okay. And then you do four years in the professional program. Okay. So I got to my second year of the professional program. I'm four years in KU, six years in deep college, mm -hmm. and I fail a class. Mm. And I fail a class not by the grade level. I mean, I had a grade that was considered passing by all means. Okay. But I missed a sub benchmark in the syllabus that said I needed a, an exam average mm -hmm. of seventy percent. Okay. I finished with like a sixty-eight, sixty-nine, or something like that. Mm -hmm. It was essentially three test questions I was off by. Whoa! I had a lot going on that semester um, between personal life, mental health, just everything, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> there was no excuses with the school. They wouldn't accept anything. I told them like every bad card that could have been dealt was dealt to me that wow. semester, and. Uh, I had to wait a whole school year to retake that one class. And um, I struggled socially, you know, like watching all of my, my best friends move on without me mm. into the next year. And I really relied on them to mm. study and to feel like I was doing well. Mm -hmm. And um, for the first time, I actually felt like the most stranded, the most alone. Mm. And I didn't feel like I had anyone to relate to, not even my parents and um, or comfortable even sharing with. Yeah. And uh yeah, so it took me a really long time to come to terms with with what that meant mm -hmm. and how not everything needs to be on a certain timeline. Like, mm -hmm. it's okay. It's not okay that I failed a class, but it's okay that it happened and that mm -hmm. life will move on and I will eventually get to, to end game. Mm -hmm. And so they threw me into the MBA program, so I'd never had to re-enroll to KU. Okay. So they were like, here, just go do some business classes. Uh -huh. And so that's what happened. I did the business school. And I um, did the business school. Mm. I was in the business school. And um, I had a lot more free time since I wasn't doing pharmacy school classes and um, still struggling, still feeling really lonely and um, like I had lost purpose. Okay. I started to realize that I didn't want to be a pharmacist as much anymore. And if I was struggling, that maybe this was a sign. Mm -hmm. And... I spontaneously went to go visit my parents in Chicago. They were on a work trip. I showed up. It was around uh, spring break of 2023. And when I got back, I went to go check the mail and a flyer fell in my lap about a pageant. Mm. And I was like, that's weird. Like my mom did pageants her entire life or mm -hmm. her younger adult life. And mm -hmm. um, I always swore against it. Like, if you knew me growing up, I was like, I'm not going to be a model. I'm not going to do pageantry. Like, that's my mom's thing. I am I'm I will always be Helen's daughter, but I want to be known as Haley. Mm. I don't want to be known as Helen's daughter. Mm -hmm. And I really protested it. But then I saw the flyer in my lap, and I was like, nothing is going well for me right now. Mm. Like, what's the harm in trying something new like this that I've been denying for so long? Like, the worst that could happen is that I lose, I go home. Yeah. And hopefully I learned something in the process. Yeah. And so I signed up for that one pageant and then I was like, I'm very go big or go home. So okay. I signed up for the one and I was like, I think there's a bigger one. Yeah. And so I Googled it and I found Miss Kansas USA and I was like, mm, I think I'm going to do that one instead. Wow. And so, yeah, I just went for the money. I just signed up, tried not to tell my parents. And then I was like, this is really stupid. I'm like, I have the biggest asset in my back pocket, which is my mom. Yeah. She did this. She's yeah. a master at it. She's great. Why would I try to hide this from her? Yeah. And so I called her up. She did try to talk me out of it. She's like, why don't you watch a year? Mm. And I was like, no, that's going to, I'm not going to want to do it in a year. Like mm -hmm. the, the momentum is now. And so I did, like I signed up that March. The competition was in June. I had very little walking experience. Like if you were to compare my walk and my talk from June to when I competed at Miss USA in September, like mm -hmm. I look like two different people. Mm. And um, yeah, I really, the rest of the rest is history. Like I just, I, 
the feeling of putting that crown on my head was so surreal. Mm. But then the lessons I learned, people ask me what I've learned as Miss USA and the biggest takeaway. And I say it's so cheesy, but I it it was a year for me to focus on myself. It's a lot about philanthropy and I'm going out and I'm doing different things in the community, mm -hmm. but it takes a certain type of person to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I uh, learned the most about myself and how to be alone again and be comfortable with that. And I rediscovered my independence and my confidence and how someone can be both beautiful and intelligent mm -hmm. and um, be impactful in a community. So mm -hmm. now I'm here back to full-time pharmacy school. Um, I live every day full of anxiety. Mm. Uh, I have multiple exams a week. So mm. um, just trying to get to get to the end. And after that, I've stopped holding on to the an exact game plan. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just like, okay, I want to graduate. Yeah. And uh, kind of go from there. Holy cow. So you, so you had never done any pageantry. Pageantries. Yeah. And then you got this flyer and then you were just like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And then you yeah. looked up and you said that there was a bigger one. Yeah. The, the Miss Kansas. Yeah. Miss Kansas USA. So Miss Kansas and Miss Kansas USA is two different things. Also. Okay. I there's apologize. so many. There's No, no, no. No one really understands it unless you're in the world. But there's like different um, pageant systems, I would okay. say. I would say there's like probably six or seven major ones. Okay. And so the one I chose... Uh, feeds into Miss USA and then if you win Miss USA you go to Miss Universe oh. so it's the biggest pageant system because Miss Universe Whoa. is the most watched one in the world wow yeah so I really I liked zero to 100 on that one and you only had like what five months to prep like three three two two and a half three yeah and people you were going up against have been doing this since they were children yeah and you just walked up there and took it yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, congratulations. Thank you. And what what year was that? So I'm Miss Kansas USA 2023. Okay. I just gave up my title um, this past June. So I crowned the new girl mm. and then she competed at Miss USA. And, uh, wow. Yeah, it's just, I, I'm a has-been now. Whoa. So does, did that kind of, did that um, scratch your itch for that world are you still interested do you want to return yeah. um a little bit i i didn't do like sororities or anything during mm. undergrad and in high school i was a band kid and i i feel like it's weird to say this but i predominantly hung around guys i have brothers mm -hmm. like i just feel like i get along with them a little bit easier and mm -hmm. so for me like i kind of struggle with there's still a lot of cattiness that goes on with uh, with pageantry. Mm -hmm. And I think whether girls realize they're doing it or not, when you stand there backstage and you're getting ready to go on stage, like it's very easy to get in your own head and see like another girl in their bikini or another girl in their dress and be like, oh, I wish I had this feature or that feature. Mm -hmm. or I wish I did my hair like them. Or mm -hmm. it's, it's really easy to get in your own head about that. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I didn't even place at Miss USA. And it's very easy to say, well, out of 51 women, they take the top 20. That means if I didn't make the top 20, I was not 20 of the most beautiful people in that room and not 20 of the most smartest people in that room. And it's really easy to let that tear you down. Mm. Cause knowing that I like, cause then you don't feel adequate enough. Like, mm. oh, what I'm doing isn't enough compared to all these women on stage. Mm -hmm. But I continue to tell people that um, the experience alone of being allowed to compete in Miss USA, you're only allowed to compete once, like in oh. your lifetime. Like, oh. I can never recompete. Okay. I can never become Miss Kansas again. I can never switch states and do it for another state. Like Whoa. it's one shot. Wow. Okay. It's essentially more competitive than being an NFL football player. Yeah. Because they get to go back to the Super Bowl as many times as their team allows, right? right. And there's a whole team of them that gets a ring if right. they win. Yeah. But um. Wow. We get one shot. Whoa. Yeah. So, this is so interesting to me. This is such a new world. I I always would hear people talk about you know like the what was that one show toddlers and tiaras yeah yeah so that's kind of that world right i mean a little bit i would say like your parents some parents are not as involved as you get older mm -hmm. um, my parents were uh i wanted them to be there my mom was my momager she literally came and she lived with me for mm -hmm. several months mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean i guess that's the best way to de describe okay. how it starts is okay. toddlers and tiaras I'm just trying to make the connections. Um, yeah. So 
let me ask you like what was one of the hardest things while is it called prep yeah essentially while you were preparing and you know you're with your mom and um you know what were some challenges kind of mentally that you had to face or overcome yeah um, that maybe you didn't realize that you were going to have before you started yeah so a lot of it was finding a balance with my mom um growing up i really butt heads with her and mm -hmm. like looking back on it now like we have a great relationship now mm -hmm. but looking back on the things that we were arguing about as a kid just it seems so small and i just think like as a child it created a little bit of trauma for me okay. and how i expected conversations to go with her because i was so used to i'm like not trying to like bad talk my mom right now but i always felt like i was being like attacked in conversations and so I never felt like I could present information when I was ready to like talk about something. It was mm. always just being pulled out of me. Mm. And I don't know, it created this like uh, insecurity and this sense of anxiety all the time in every conversation that I'm not doing well enough or I'm not measuring up when really it's the complete opposite. She's just, she wants the best for me and she's just worried and she just wants everything to go smoothly, right? Mm. And um, so in pageantry and pageant prep, she knows exactly what's going to get me that that next crown on my head. I, but she also did it 20 years ago. Mm. So I have this expectation that the system has evolved, that it's not about girls just being skinny anymore, that there could be variety. And it's not just about saying every sentence perfectly and not having an um in there. I would expect that people realize that we are human. We mm -hmm. say um when we talk. Mm -hmm. And um, we just, we butt heads on a lot of things. And I just, I was, I don't know. I was really trying to find a balance between seeing her as my mom and respecting that boundary, but also having her be my coach and knowing that she has expertise and she's not trying to be personal about the things that she's sharing with me. Like she's saying it as a coach. Yeah. So that was really hard. Um, I would say finding peace and knowing that I don't know everything mm -hmm. and that I can't predict everything that's going to happen. Like I will not know what they ask me in my interview. Mm. Um, I can prep, but, and go through mock interviews, but there's no way of knowing exactly what they're going to ask me. Okay. And I don't know. That's a lot of anxiety. And then walking yeah. in five and a half inch heels, like I, wow. on stage, mm. nothing, <laughs> there's, there's not enough prep you can do in the world for that first feeling. Um, and all you can think about is not falling on your face. So. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. What? So when you, you had, had you had walked in like five inch heels before? I mean, not really. Like I would say the summer prior. So summer of 2022, I turned 21 and I felt comfortable going out in my own skin. So I went from that, like tank top and jeans and air force look going out and i switched to 180 like all of a sudden i was wearing clubbing dresses and i was wearing heels every time i go out like mm. i people tell me all the time they're like oh my gosh i'm actually the same height as you now because mm -hmm. i like there'll be the one time where i don't have my heels on mm -hmm. like it's very common that i have a pair of heels on okay um so i had some idea but mm -hmm. being able to walk in heels like just casually versus having like a pageant walk mm. I was in over my head with that one. Okay. Um, I had no clue what to expect. I thought I had a fine walk, and then mm. uh, turns out I don't. All you have to do is record yourself, and you mm. realize it's it's not. <laughs> I think growing up, everyone has the idea, or I remember even I used to put heels on in like a shoe store just to yeah, just to try. And I can't, I can't imagine having because at five five and a half inches, I mean, it's pretty. Yeah, I mean, you're on a platform, too. So my platform's probably about that thick on the front of my toes. Okay. And then the heel itself is pretty tall, too. Yeah, I mean, you're up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's... And then so how... Like, when you're walking, you you walk down the stage, and then you pose, and then you turn and walk back? Yeah, and sometimes you, they want you to do, like, a spin or something. And during pageant prep, like, I have videos and videos and videos of me doing, like, perfect routines mm -hmm. and mastering the spins and they're super elegant or they're super sexy and you know whatever but then I get on stage and it's like like mm. all I can think about is just falling, falling over or not landing the spin and I'd rather have a perfect flawless walk without a spin 
versus one that looked incomplete because I decided to do a spin and I like my I wasn't confident enough or wasn't ready and I ruined it. Mm -hmm. So dang. Yeah, but that's going that's like what's going through my head. Like yeah. I forget that there's like the people in the audience that doesn't it's just I don't know, like it's it's the fact that they're scoring it, I guess a little bit. Like okay. I still that still eats me up a little bit when I'm on stage. I'm like, yeah. oh, these people are literally giving me a score yeah. based on how I look in a dress or how I look in a bikini. That, I can't imagine. That's, like, somebody, like, these people, like, the judges are really rating everything about you, right? Yeah, essentially. And I think, like, pageantry gets a bad rep because everyone thinks that it's just about a panel of people judging what you physically look like. Mm -hmm. But I don't think people realize that the tables have kind of turned. Like, at Miss USA, our interviews were worth 50%. Wow. So when I didn't make top 20, I knew it was my interview. Mm. I knew that, I mean, not to say that I was like the prettiest person in the room, like that, no, obviously not. But I knew that my interview carried a lot of weight and some of the questions and the way they structured them when they asked me, I was like, I already knew I was set up for failure because mm. they were looking for the flaws in my answers versus questions that would cause me to say things that were like really exciting or important or that would support me mm -hmm. doing well. Mm -hmm. So... How did you feel internally after winning Miss Kansas USA? Yeah. And then going and not making that top 20 cut? Right. So I think the way I like described it back then was that I won Miss Kansas. And because I had no prior pageantry experience, like I had this high. I was essentially one for one, right? Like mm -hmm. I had no, I had no losses. Mm -hmm. And then you go to Miss USA and I essentially didn't win. I completely lost. And I, now I understand, like, why girls feel so distraught after not winning and why they keep going back. It's mm. because you're like, okay, well, I still had more to prove. Mm. So they keep going back year after year after year. And they, you know, they don't necessarily change who they are, but they mm. make adjustments about their walk or maybe the way they're answering questions and the mm. way they're bridging. Or they, in every question in pageantry you should be able to relate it back to something you want to talk about even mm. if they don't ask you directly mm. something um and so honing in on those skills or uh finding a color that suits you better than what you wore the last time mm. um and um i i, I could see it mm. why my girls go back year after year mm -hmm. for sure do you think if you so if you wouldn't have placed and won miss kenzie would say do you think you would have wanted to go back and try it again um gosh i don't know that's tough i honestly like yeah probably because i did enjoy it. Mm -hmm. it it was it was a i felt like i made two friends then um or really i was friends with all of them but um i made two there was two girls who really made it um a pleasant experience for me mm -hmm. and um yeah i would definitely go back i i realized that it allowed me again to work on myself and to focus on some other things that I wasn't focusing on. And with more practice and more time to prep for the next pageant, whether I did it the next year or um, years later, I, I'm only strengthening myself mm -hmm. and, and working on, on the things that I'm not as good at. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I definitely probably would have gone back. Nice. And how many people were in the running for Miss Kansas USA? <laughs> so it's not like other states. Um, there was only nine of us. So I, there wasn't a lot, but, um, in other States, there's up to like 200, 200 women that can wow. be for one title. And they're all from all over Kansas. You just have to live in Kansas. Is that, is that the, like, how does that work? Uh, I mean, you just need like an address, I guess. Uh, okay. So there are girls who state hop. Um, and that, is that common? Yeah. Very common. There's mm -hmm. a lot of girls who, if they don't win in a state, they'll literally move to another state Wow. and they'll wait to compete in that pageant. As long as you fit the age range. Yeah, the age ranges, which they've lifted those, so now you could be any age. Um, Whoa. Yeah, there was women who competed this year at Miss USA. So we were the last class. My class was the last one that was capped at 28. Okay. And so I was on the younger side. Okay. Um, which I thought worked against me because a lot mm. of people have, like, established careers and stuff they could talk about. And I'm oh. like, when I'm done with school, mm. like, it's just, I don't mm. know. Um, but, yeah, now there's no age limit. So there's women who competed who are, I think, in their 40s this year. That's amazing. Yeah, I loved it. I tried That's to get my so mom cool. to do it because I was like, wouldn't it be cool if I crowned you? Like, that would make national news. That would be insane. That kind of gave me chills. Right? Whoa. I know. Wow. 
So what? So so she did it growing up, but she did it primarily where? Um, in both. Good question. The titles I know of and that I think I was around for, or not even around for, aware, yeah, aware of is the best word, was Hawaii and then in Thailand. But I know that she had a childhood home that burned down with 200 pageant trophies. I got more chills. What the heck? Yeah, so she, yeah, she had a lot of pageants. So she lost everything. Like, really, there's not a lot of evidence of her childhood pageantry oh. um, experiences. But I was at Mrs. Hawaii 2002 and when she won that one because that one was the Mrs. Division. Yeah. And then um, she went to – she was Miss Thailand World when she was – Whoa. Yeah. So that was a different pageant system. Okay. So like I said, um, the best way to describe it is like the Miss USA of Thailand. But that's huge. Yeah. It's a big deal. Whoa. And uh, yeah, so she was like 16 when she competed and – um yeah went to place in the top five at miss world holy cow yeah continental beauty queen of asia um and then she did a lot of modeling uh which she did up until we moved to the states in 2010 and then she just focused on raising her kiddos shout out your mom that's so cool no yeah she really has uh quite a cool story to tell about her life she's very interesting what is one of the biggest takeaways or lessons um, that you've gained from either of your parents? You know, it's interesting. I had a pretty personal conversation with my mom last night um, about stuff that's happened to me since being in college. And at one point, she just wanted to hang up on me because she was frustrated with the things I was telling her. Last night? Yeah, last night. And I was like, I called her back. I was like, hold on. Let me like, let me put some more words. Let me explain myself a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm trying to give you a pat on the back here. Mm. I'm like, basically there was a scenario. I feel like I can't say what I'm saying without explaining the situation. But um, I have been sexually mistreated by men more than one time. Like, yeah, like I, and I'm, I have a weird relationship with that sort of trauma that I have, I'm able to get over it for a little bit. I had a big wall up. Like I wasn't interested in getting to know anyone any further. Like I just, it's still, it bleeds into a lot of my relationships. Um, I have a hard time with trust and you know, that sense of loyalty. Like I I struggle with that still. Um, And that's a whole other can of worms, but I was telling her about a scenario that I had not told her before. Um, And Mm. who, when, where, where, you know, all the, all the descriptive factors. And, uh, she shut down on me and um, cause she started to say, well, I started to explain to her that I don't think that I should change the way that I look or the way I act or the way I go out, dress, whatever, because someone else can't keep their hands to themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to give her a pat on the back for giving me the courage to be so strong and something mm-hmm. that's so traumatizing. Mm-hmm. And I know that I was hurting her with the things I was telling her and that no parent wants to hear that their kid has gone through something like that, especially their daughter. But I was trying to tell her that you have raised me with a good head on my shoulders. And I'm very appreciative that, you know, you were so worried when I was so much young, like when I was younger and you kept me from doing things I wasn't supposed to do, whether I was curious and and trying or experimenting when I was younger or not. Um, she really like my parents never hid anything from me as a kid like if I wanted to know something they were going to tell me Mm -hmm. and I thank them for that because now I feel like like if I make a bad decision I it's gosh like I've never been arrested I never I don't do anything that I'm really not supposed to like I I think that's the best case scenario for them Mm -hmm. and so when something else happens to me and it wasn't necessarily my fault I'm just trying to like I told them like I got out of this situation because of things that you taught me mm-hmm. and I got out safely. Mm-hmm. And um, for that, I just want them to be like, okay, like we did good. Yeah. Like that sucks, but um, we did good. Yeah. That's amazing. Thank you for, for being so open about that, that I can't imagine being a parent on the other side. Yeah. I mean, I can't either. I, uh, and for that, I give my parents grace when I tell them stuff like that. Like I don't owe anyone that that secret you know Mm -hmm. that 
like what has happened mm -hmm. um that's something that i can keep bottled up forever and not mm -hmm. to say that i'm like internalizing it like my therapist knows about it mm -hmm. but like i i don't owe that to anyone and so the fact that i'm sharing it with you i'm just sharing yeah. i don't necessarily want you to fight my battles for me right. um, i just want you to be a shoulder yeah. hear what i have to say and um yeah i think I, my parents have handled it yeah as well i think as they could prepare for no one expects to hear that from their child yeah I think your parents, from what I've learned about you, have done an amazing job, um, you know, raising you. And um, I think definitely have what a great head on your shoulders. Um, and also, this is it, it's hard because, you know, I want to say I know the words don't fill the pain. But, you know, I feel um, I feel sorry. And I'm sorry that that situation happened. And I know it's it's hard. It's similar to, you know, when somebody passes away when someone says, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah. It's kind of, it's almost like a auto response. Yeah. I, um, and I don't want it to feel like that. Right. I think I really struggle with even hearing like that saying, not because I think it's like an auto response because I know that feeling, but because I really reflect on the situations that I ended up in and how I got all the way to that point. And I'm like, what did I do? I'm like, I still blame myself sometimes. I still find that, you know, my parents are like, well, why didn't you like go to the cops or report it or something? And I'm like, I sometimes still feel like it was my fault. Mm -hmm. I feel like if in a, in a he said, she said, somehow, like, I know I said no. I know what consent is. I said no. I said it in every shape, way, and form. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in my twisted brain, I don't, I don't really know if it's from a, a different kind of trauma or, or what, but I still find that it's my fault somehow. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear people say like, oh, I'm so sorry you went through that. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I don't even, I, I don't know. I such a, I, it's like a rabbit hole. I just get lost in it. Mm. Wow. Well, again, thank you for being so strong and, and, having that being open enough to talk about that on, yeah. you know, for people to, to listen. Yeah. So thank you. Is there with, you know, there's what, two, two and a half months left of the year. Right. Is there a big lesson from this year specifically that you have learned or that you have, um, or is there something that you got to work on this year that you're really proud of? Yeah, let's see. Um, so I live by a Nicki Minaj song line mm. and it's a my life is a movie and i'm never offset mm. and i say that because i believe in like chakras yeah and i was once told that i draw in like chaos i draw in chaotic energy and like you could follow me from one day to the next and i feel like there's always something interesting going on mm. and not necessarily all good things either mm. and so i constantly live with this anxiety that i'm still causing this chaos okay. and i don't know how to like chill out and so this year i had an opportunity to go to europe for five weeks uh two of my dad's siblings live in europe one in germany one in italy and um wow. yeah my both big families i'll add <laughs> uh yeah both fa uh, both of my parents are siblings of six or seven i believe yeah so there's they're big 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 families and how many siblings do you have I have two younger brothers. Okay. Yeah. One's cool. in Atlanta and one's in high school. So, um, yeah. Anywho. Uh, so we went to Europe and the reason we went to Europe, uh, and the way I like to explain it is, um, because this past Christmas Eve, my maternal grandmother passed away mm. from Alzheimer's dementia mm. and she was in a home. So we knew it was coming, but of course you can never prepare for something like that. Yeah, and one I'm of the sorry. things on her bucket list was to go to Europe. Mm. and when we couldn't do that you know i think it really ate away at my mom especially that we couldn't like give her her one last wish mm -hmm. and then my other grandmother the, she still lives in hawaii um we were told she only has one kid that lives in hawaii with her okay. all the other kids have moved across the u.s or in europe and um my uncle said that seems like maybe she has some dementia signs coming on and so we decided to do this Europe trip because we were like, okay, we missed, we dropped the ball with other grandma. Let's not drop the ball mm -hmm. with this one. 
And um, my grandmother in Hawaii, uh, her father was in World War II as an historian um, and flew glider planes. Amazing. So he kept very detailed notes of his entire time uh, with wow. the infantry. And so we were able to kind of break down those notes, find interviews, and go to a lot of the locations uh, where he was during World War II in Europe. So we spent five weeks what? literally traveling around to uh, a Mafi coast where they flew in and they walked up the, the mountain or we went to Normandy. Um, we went to Market Garden. Um, That's incredible. Yeah, exploring all these things so that she could write her book. <laughs> now, the issue wow. was is her dementia was a lot far, a lot more worse than we had anticipated mm. uh, before the trip. And I really struggle with the black and white of the medical industry. Um, I feel like I've kind of I say this lightly because it's not 100% true, but I feel like I've kind of lost touch with my empathy because I see things so black and white with medicine. Um, and so when I see her, it's almost like I see her as a patient. Like I know she's my grandmother, mm -hmm. but I see that she's getting worse on this trip and all I want to do is get her help. Mm. Instead of seeing that this is more than just her, this is about all of us spending time with her, um, making memories, not necessarily for her, but with her mm -hmm. for ourselves too. And so I didn't enjoy a single day of that trip oh at all oh because i i just i couldn't wrap my head around why we were on the trip mm -hmm. like i just i felt like we were hurting her mm. and it was hard for her to enjoy she couldn't remember things day to day mm. and um i just i really struggled with that aspect like i felt like my family members were being selfish mm. choosing to continue on a trip that was only making her dementia worse you know what i mean yeah yeah. And um, wow. I'd say the biggest lesson I've learned is to, one, pick my battles. Mm -hmm. uh, my cat died when I was overseas as well. Oh my and that gosh. was a big deal. My cat was 13 years old. He, I wow. consider him my first husband. Like, I love my cat to death. <laughs> and um, I didn't have a chance to grieve it mm -hmm. at all because I was just so wrapped up in all of the family matters. And so I've learned to, like, one, not take life for granted. I mean, I know it was just my cat, but it could have been anyone. And to see uh dementia and alzheimer's the way i did on this trip mm -hmm. um taught me a little bit more about enjoying things in the moment but mm -hmm. also preparing for what that might look like later in my life and so mm -hmm. now i'm like every day i'm thinking about like if i need to make a will for myself mm -hmm. and the things i'm not telling people you know if i were to pass today like what are my regrets mm -hmm. and the things left unsaid and so I think that's the biggest takeaway of this year is not leaving anything to to chance and to saying things that you want to say and saying it with purpose. And mm. Yeah. Wow. I'm sorry that your cat passed away too. What the I, heck? I'm sorry. Yeah, I told you. Like I. That's so sad. This whole chaos theory I have is um, you're starting to get a little taste of it. I feel like animals passing is definitely um, kind of not slept on, but kind of overlooked a little bit. Oh, yeah. 100%. You know? I yeah. mean, I. My dog, I have a dog right now, and he is my emotional support dog, and I don't think people take that seriously. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So, so I'm curious, too. So you're half Hawaiian, half Thai. Yeah, so my my dad just grew up in Hawaii. Oh. So he's actually, I would just say, um, I mean, I really don't even know. Like, European is the oh. easiest way to Like, my last name is Berger, which right. is very austrian german yeah that kind and, of threw me off yeah um but he like his entire family just grew up over there oh i yeah really maybe i should find out how they got there but um uh, okay. yeah they they grew up there but my mom is half thai so i'm quarter and um, oh mm -hmm. cool so then when you were growing up you know for, for myself growing up you know being asian american and being adopted yeah I had a weird, especially being in Kansas, I had an elementary school. It was fine because, you know, we had a whole bunch of different people that were indigenous. We had yeah, people sure. that were like black, white, Hispanic, especially the school I went to in that area. It was very mixed, right. which was great. Right. <clears throat> but something happened when I transitioned into the junior high, high school phase. Right. Was that the race became a bigger thing. Mm. And it went from being, you know, as kids. If somebody's cute, they're cute, you know? Right. And then as I got older, the that really kind of changed. Right. And it was, I had so much confidence as a kid. My parents instilled that in me, my family. Yeah. And it was amazing. And then as I got older into these grades, 
that confidence kind of started to shift because yeah. I didn't see Asian Americans represented. Same. And especially in the Midwest, I was one of two in elementary in my in my grade. Right. And then she was also adopted. Right. Okay. So and she was from China. So that was like they didn't have a lot to pull from. Right. And then as we were getting older, it was always oh, you're like the most attractive Asian guy I've seen. You know, there was always a, there was always like a, almost like a, like a, hold on, wait, wait. You know, it wasn't like a, like a backhand compliment. compliment. Yeah. Yeah. I 100% can relate to that. I identify more with my Asian side than I do with my whiter side, I guess, for lack of better terms. And um, I've always struggled with that. I remember like I jumped around from school to school to school and the school in Wichita not gonna say names i wish i could but uh i was literally told to go back to where i came from it's like what makes me any different than you i literally have two passports like i speak your language Mm -hmm. very well Mm -hmm. um like that compliment is uncalled for and in middle school when i was in eighth grade i shaved my head i played volleyball and i just thought it would be fun to have like that little soccer flow you Mm -hmm. know it's like shaved all around and my cyrus haircut I lost all my friends oh yeah. all my friends because oh. then you go through the whole sexuality thing and i'm like okay well whether i am gay or not in this mm-hmm. moment it shouldn't matter mm-hmm. it's a haircut mm-hmm. hair grows back mm-hmm. and yeah i lost a lot of friends over that and i really i realized that people show their true colors when you do something that's not outside of their normal mm-hmm. and so i think like different races I don't know why this is like triggering me to think about where my parents live right now. Like that area, like their racism is so bad. Yeah. So bad. There's... I would not want to be in Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> Ohio. <laughs> shout out Ohio. Not okay. <laughs> Ohio do better. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, that's, that's really relatable. Cause I just, I don't know. I feel like the stories I share, like I shared so much about how I grew up and how I lived in so many homes and, I've been all over the place and I have all of these experiences, which I thought would make me relatable as a person. Cause you say something and I'm like, Oh wait, like I can relate on a different level. It mm-hmm. may not be like the same exact thing, but mm-hmm. I can come at it somehow. Mm-hmm. But somehow I think it almost alienated me mm-hmm. because I have all of these experiences that now other people can't relate to. I can relate to you, but you can't relate to me. That's powerful. Right. And, um, wow. Yeah. It, uh, it really put me in a bubble. People thought I was a liar. Mm. and um not to say i grew up with money because i definitely did not Mm -hmm. but it gets to a point where like i'm very proud of the things i can afford Mm -hmm. and i'm not necessarily trying to show it off Mm -hmm. but i'm proud because i remember a time where Mm -hmm. i never in my wildest dreams thought i could afford something like i remember ramen days yeah and i love the ramen days yeah and to say i can afford a steak now it's like man like that's yeah. a good feeling and yeah. all people see is like oh she's eating all these steaks mm-hmm. like where's all this money coming from and then it just like cascades into a whole thing and i just remember it all coming down to to where i'm from and and um not belonging or not looking asian enough to identify mm-hmm. as asian but then not being fully white as well mm-hmm. so ugh. people are mean yeah Definitely. I would love to do a whole nother one with you at some point about growing up Asian American and talking about certain scenarios. Right. Because I think it's it's something that as much I always tell my mom growing up that, you know, being like make, people who make jokes about Asians, it's like the bottom of the barrel in, in, yeah. in the sense of like and I try to compare it for, you know, if somebody says the N word, everyone is like. Wait. But why do we still get to ching ching chong everything? But it, and that's what I'm saying. But if somebody calls someone a chink, everyone's laughing. Yeah. No, I have. Trust me. Like, like that's I'm, a whole can of worms. I <laughs> I can relate to that one. In growing up, I remember I'd always people would always just have these. They'd always do the thing with the eyes. Yeah. You know. Oh and yeah. It's it's weird. The accent. Yeah. Oh yeah. The assumptions I... they would always be like, "Well, why aren't you in the gifted program? Because you're Asian." Well, yeah, I'm I'm in pharmacy school and everyone is like, oh, so like you didn't have a choice. And I was like, actually, I did. That's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy. You didn't have a ch- That's, yeah. Haley, this has been 
an amazing conversation. For sure. Um, thank you so much for being so strong and being so vulnerable and letting um, people see a part of you that is hard and that I don't know you personally, so I don't know if this is something that you regularly talk about, but um, it really shows how much confidence you have within yourself and how I think well you're doing on this journey that we call life. Yeah, thank you. So thank you for sitting with me. Thank you for talking. Um, do you have anything you would like to say to the people before uh, we end this? Um, I don't know. I, I guess live life to the fullest, which sounds so cheesy, but do the things you want to do and do it with confidence. Mm. And um, yeah, have no regrets. Mm. And tell your mom you love her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, call your parents if you still have them. Yes. And if please. you don't, call someone that you love and, and tell them that how much they mean to you. Exactly. That's something that I, I try to push a lot that give flowers while they're still here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like that. Hmm. I'm going to go buy myself some flowers today. Mm. Got to. Maybe some sunflowers. Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> thank you guys for watching another podcast. Again, big thank you to Haley. If you guys want to follow her, I'll be sure to put your socials that you sure. want in yeah. the description. Um, and. That's going to do it. If you guys have any questions or anything, you can always leave them in the comments below. I'm going to uh, upload this today. So this will be, it'll be up today. Cool. Yeah. So thank you. And kind of just because. Oh my goodness.